Japan. And once again, we have the pleasure of talking with author Alex Kerr. Thank you so much for joining. Hi, JJ. It's always a pleasure. It's wonderful. And this is your new book this year, Hidden Japan, an astonishing world of thatch villages, ancient shrines, and primeval forests. <laughs> and uh, this was a long time coming to the English version. Originally, it was in Japanese, right? That's right. Yes, I did it in Japanese some years ago. Uh, the the research for it or the, the travels for it were done back in 2018 and 19. Yeah. And, and then it came uh, out during COVID in Japanese. And finally, in English, just, I mean, in, in America, just like two months ago. Wow. Yeah, it's it's amazing to see another wonderful book of yours. And Alex, you always focus on uh, slower, more meaningful, sustainable travel. Uh, you talk a little bit about the over tourism project uh, problems that we're having. Um, but one of the things that really struck me is you said in the in the introduction, uh, you made a prediction in Dogs and Demons. Um, that the development, the modern development and loss of culture in Japan would really turn off international visitors. Hmm. And that didn't really happen, right? No, I was dead wrong on that. <laughs> <laughs> so then that's why you wrote this book um, for the Japanese audience, because they would have a better understanding of what was being lost. Is that yes. right? Yeah, you know, well, the thing about foreign travelers, and, and I understand this, I mean, they've come to see what's wonderful about Japan, right? And so obviously they'll be looking for that. And that's to their credit, you know, as people that love this country and are interested. And so I get it, but it does mean that, that they literally, it doesn't impinge on the retina. They won't see it at the same time. And uh, also there's, it's very difficult for people to know what this country was. Uh, before everything got concreted over and so on. Whereas the Japanese have a much better sense of it. And there are many Japanese who really care about these things and want to know about them. And so it was, the original book was really written for the Japanese who think about these things in that way. They're not, it's, they're not um, amazed and, and it's not all new to them. You know, they live here. And I, I've noticed this in the many talks that we've had and watching you with your keynote at the Minka Summit, for example, you always talk about standing on the shoulders of giants and being inspired by other people. And one of those in the foreword, you talk about Shirasu Masako yes, yes. and her wonderful book about hidden hamlets. Yes. In Japanese. She, I mean, th this book is really written as a kind of homage to her in the sense that her book, I think it inspired a lot of people, not just me, uh, but I wanted to do a kind of, what if you were to write, because her book's now 50 years old or more, what if you were to write it now uh, from a slightly different perspective, but still t with her view and her particular take on these things. And some of the places I go to in, in the book actually are in uh, her original Hidden Hamlets, and others are not, but it's sort of a mix of places. But I was trying to use her point of view, which was summed up in a, we did a, uh, a talk once that was in a Japanese magazine called What's Real? And that was her. She didn't get carried away with the official dogma of what it's supposed to be. She looked at what it really is, and I loved her for that. And that's what I tried to do. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so this, the aim of this book, and you talk about this in the forward, is to really uncover secrets that can help us preserve or appreciate at least uh, the cultural and environmental treasures, which there are still some in Japan. Yeah. And uh, you've highlighted 10 of them in the book. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure you could have done 100. It must have been really hard to choose these 10, right? <laughs> It was, and, there lot, and in fact, I'm now working for the Japanese publisher. I'm working on the next book where we travel to six more places. So I'm working on those articles as we speak. So there's still plenty. Japan is has, has such a wealth of wonderful things and there will be no end of it. And I could do go on and do another 10 and another six. Uh, so that, that uh, these things still exist for sure. Yeah, well, we look forward to it. We hope you write many, many more books. <laughs> 
Uh, we had some comments before we even started. Yeah. Uh, so we'll just start with those. Why not? Mm -hmm. uh, David on Twitter said, do you have any anecdotes of how your books have affected people's lives? Uh, mm -hmm. He said Lost Japan and Dogs and Demons had a huge effect on him. Hmm. You must have so many. Uh, well, uh, yes. So I get I get emails all the time and people come up to me after talks and and these books have been um, for some people, you know, have had quite an impact. Lost Japan, I think, for many people, is the kind of the doorway into the magic kingdom. You know, it's this view of Japan where you're really looking at what's wondrous, and so people come often. They come to Japan with that in hand. Dogs and Demons is for a slightly more, I would call, mature audience. And I don't mean by age. I mean, how long have you been in the country? And so what I find is fresh off the boat, and they really hate me for it. And people say, you're racist, and how could you say these things? And, you know, this is so biased, and what about the beauty? And, da, da, da. and that they're the fresh ones. And then after a year or two, what I hear is, yeah, I see it, but, well, didn't you kind of went overboard. And then after about five years, they say, it brought tears to my eyes. This is what's been bothering me, and it's been what I've been thinking about, but I didn't have the answer. I didn't know how to look at it. Thank you, you know? So so dogs and demons, uh, I think you need to be here for a while. Yeah. yeah. But isn't it, it reminds me, like, the reaction to dogs and demons, also the, the way that you renovated your beautiful Chiori in Ia Valley uh, to keep the Japanese aesthetic, but to bring it into modern relevance, all of the changes that you're talking about, all of the, the things which sound critical are actually because you have such a deep love of Japanese culture and traditions. You love it here. It's not because you're, you're thinking there's anything less than. It's actually a, a hope that things will get better. Well, right? that's exactly what it's all about. And in fact, plus Japan and dogs and demons go hand in glove. They're just different sides of the same picture. And one of the things that actually Shirase Masako and I talked about, uh, she, there's a famous a anecdote where she had asked Rosanji, the famous potter and designer, to design a kimono for her for the cherry blossom season. And it came back and it was covered tip to toe with cherry blossoms. Da, 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 and she beat him up. She said, this is ridiculous. You know, there are cherry blossoms all around me. Do I need a lot more on my kimono? No. And then we laughed about it. And then she said, you know, if you really love something, you have to get angry about it. And that's what it's about. And in a sense, Dogs and Demons is something that every an awful lot of people that deal with Japan know about. But they are kind of afraid to think about it because you're supposed to love Japan. It's I, I view it as the kind of the alcoholic uncle problem. In within the family, we don't want to deal with it. It's too difficult. So we just ignore it and, you know, that's a quirk of our dear old uncle. But actually the poor guy needs intervention and needs help. And so that's what this, that's what Dogs and Demons really is. Yes, it's from love and it's exactly as she described. Tough love. Yeah. I was, I was walking through a Buddhist temple with Nathan Mishan, who's been studying Buddhism for 20 years and practicing. Mm -hmm. And he mm -hmm. said, that's like the Neo guardians in the front of the temple gate. They're like tough love. They're supposed to scare you, scare well, you. That's by a very interesting track. idea. Yes. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, Lost Japan is the lovely kanon, you know, in the in the temple itself. But uh, dogs and demons are the neo. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Um, also, gentleman in Japan said, "I'd love to work with Alex one day. He's uh, run. He's working in a ryokan in mm -hmm. Amami, Osaka." And looks like a beautiful rural oh, area. I know that ryokan. Amami is the name of the ryokan, right? I think I, so. I've met the Okami-san, and and sometimes I see her postings on Facebook, and it looks lovely. Yeah. yeah. So he would love to take you on walks. You well, must get invitations all him. the time, all over the country, Alex. But I think you talked about before in previous episodes about it all depends on funding, right? Whether you can actually invest time and effort and yeah, yeah. takes money to do the renovations and development, things like that, yeah. right? Well, traveling somewhere doesn't take that much money. And I do plenty of that. Uh, the renovation and the actual work on trying to work on a particular neighborhood or something, that involves the city 
or the local government of some type getting really involved and being able to fund it. Because here's the big difference. You know, we did Machia townhouses in Kyoto. And because, you know, zillions of people come to Kyoto every year, you could build anything, right? You could build a, a, a you know, a, a, a bunk bed somewhere and they'll come. So it doesn't matter. You'll, you can pull it off. And we did. We, we got no help from any government. We got investors. We borrowed. We did it, it with our own money. Fine. In the countryside, it doesn't work that way. Uh, it needs the initial investment of the government agencies. And once they get it up and going, then it takes on its own life and the locals can manage it and it starts to bring in people and money and interest from outside and it can all happen. But it really depends on, on, on that for, uh, for a lot of these towns. Yeah, you've also talked about um, like what you were able to set up in uh, the Ia Valley um, that talking about zero yen tourism. Zero yen the tourism. Tour, the tour bus versus the slower, longer stay yes. in a renovated cottage. Yeah. You just catch us up on that because that's a key part of this yeah. book as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, it all began with something called zero dollar tourism which Southeast Asian countries and Australia were facing. And the origin of this name was uh, tour groups from China where they would sell the tickets in Shanghai. They would come to Bali or something. They'd stay in a Chinese hotel and ride a Chinese bus and eat in a Chinese restaurant. And all the money was Alipay and went back to China and none of it came into Bali. And so they started calling it zero dollar tourism. And now there are laws about this in Vietnam and some other places on this particular issue uh, to try to prove it because it became a, an issue. But going way beyond the Chinese, if, if you think of it from a broader point of view, zero dollar, dollar tourism is where it looks great. There are a lot of numbers and plenty of people coming, but they're not spending money or if they are, it's not going into the local economy, right? And a great example of that would be Shirakawa, the famous thatched roof village, which gets incredible numbers. Uh, I think it's uh, maybe, um, oh gosh, uh, 1.4 million, I think, that's something like that. I, I don't know if that number is correct, but we're in the, that's in the neighborhood every year. Uh, but when they did a study, they figured out that after 40 minutes they left, they may or may not have bought a 100 yen drink from the vending machine. And, and, but they use the toilet, they use the parking lot, they leave trash, you know, it causes it actually expense for the village. And so that's zero dollar, or we can now call it zero yen uh, tourism. And uh, unfortunately, that's the kind of thing the government agencies love, right? Because they can look at those statistics and wow, we got a million people, fabulous. Uh, but when you look at the content of it, it isn't necessarily beneficial. And of course, the answer is slow tourism and getting people to spend the night, walk through the town. I mean, one of the key things I talk a lot about is access. In Japan, access must always be right next to the temple. We've got a huge parking lot and a Michino Eki where they sell uh, goods and so on. And no, in Europe, they're doing the opposite. Down, hundreds of downtowns have now closed to cars. You make people walk, which runs against that's such a good um, example. In the book, you gave an example of be going to Stone Edge. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They make people in Stone Edge. They put the visitor center two, set, two, two kilometers away. And so when you get there, it's quiet. You feel the mystery. They haven't destroyed the ambiance. And of course, that's you're walking through fields. So that's not a money issue so much. But in towns, when you have saved the old sando, you know how temples and shrines have a sando walkway. If you get people to walk down that sando, they're going to stop in at a coffee shop. They'll buy something. They'll eat something. You know, it, they spend some money and they spend some time. Uh, because another key aspect of all this, it's not just the money that comes in. It's, I would call it the community of love and interest for the place. And that is built on if people have spent a bit of time there. Absolutely. Uh, Melanie has just said, bravo, Alex, and you too, JJ. Great to have you here, Melanie. Any thoughts on Osaka Expo? <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, you know, expos in general are not my thing. And uh, they're not a, t a bad thing. It's fine. Uh, do it or not do it. Uh, I have kind of not so much interest in that. Um, I think they probably will do it. 
because it's been budgeted and and it's in the works and in Japan and almost anywhere I think it's very difficult to stop something like this unless there's some really desperate reason so I, I suppose it'll happen and and there may be some uh, interesting things that happen there but but I have to say it's not uh, a top item on my agenda yeah. It's sometimes a great place to to walk around if you're in the travel industry and see places you haven't really thought about and see how they're really trying to develop it in a more sustainable way uh, with like you did in Ia Valley. It's not only about the guest houses. It's once you make the guest house, you bring more people in who are going to cater to those visitors who are going to want to eat there. Uh, you need staff for the places. Um, it's developing community. And the last time I went to a tourism expo, I was actually impressed to find some of those, that it wasn't just the top sites, that it was smaller <clears throat> communities talking yeah. about using tourism as a way to rebuild. Well, that that's happening in Japan. Uh, Japan and, uh, and local areas, I have realized that it's desperately needed, actually. It's the last hope, I think, for small towns. Uh, uh, agriculture and forestry and fishery are not coming back. They, they should. There are ways. If the government was far sighted, they could. But they're not. It's not going to happen. And so the the hope is tourism, and there are these success stories. And so that's one reason why I get asked to to work with these towns because they can now see it happening in other places. Yeah, you mentioned a, a couple of the places in the book. You mentioned it's appealing to people as an eye turn, like a, an yes. appealing place to go from the cities out to these rural areas yes. to set up new businesses, young entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. I, I saw this a lot in Onomichi. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, a lot of new energy. Uh, Onomichi in is a real, a real buzz, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And it's wonderful to see, isn't it? So there's the U-turn, people coming back to the the rural town where they after they've been away for a while but the i turn is interesting too brand new destination for them right yes and that was happening already but here's where covid actually played an advantageous role in that it got people out of their offices and people learned how to work virtually and japanese companies initially fought that but they eventually gave into it to some degree and as, as in america and in other places once people have left those offices they don't necessarily want to go back and so what they find is that those who are lucky enough to have a company that will still allow it, and there are some, can go to the countryside. And I, we've seen the most amazing kind of boom here in Kameoka, where I live. Uh, we're only about 20 some kilometers west of Kyoto. And until pretty recently, this was considered the end of the earth, right? Although actually I calculated it, it's closer from Kyoto Station to Kameoka than it is from Shinjuku to Shibuya. I mean, from Tokyo Eki to Shibuya, right? So, I mean, it's really just like a part of Kyoto, but because of the mountain, Kyoto people thought it was just out of bounds. Now they've cottoned on and there are fields and old houses and there's room to do things and young people are moving here. Yeah, interesting. Uh, we had a comment from Yunohara Mm -hmm. Hi, join Alex Lee from Eugene here, wondering if it was difficult for Alex to get Chiori started as a guest house at the very beginning, uh, hiring staff, providing meals, that kind of thing. Was it a lot of hurdles? Okay, well, um, hi, Lee, and I've been dying to get to Eugene, actually, and see you. So that's, the, uh, <laughs> you're reminding me of something I really want to do. And good luck to your project. Um, the thing about Chiori is it happens so slowly. And there are actually several phases in this. We're, we're talking this year, in fact, is exactly 50 years since I bought that house. Uh, so, <laughs> And so the first, I'd say, two decades, really, it was just fun. And we, I went up there with friends, and we would have parties. And I was free enough to be able to spend like a month up there at a time. And and uh, we, it was all handmade. There was no money. We had to carry water. For, there was no water. We had to bring water in a bucket from the neighbors. You know, um, it was very primitive. Uh, but it was it was fun and in in a kind of a very relaxed, pretty primitive way. So then, once we got the house in somewhat better condition, then there was a kind of second phase when visitors started to come and we would charge them a little money, and we had full time caretaker in the house, who I paid to live there, 
and they would collect, you know, it was, it was like a cent yen or something, a thousand yen from the back. It was basically backpackers. But we got 30,000 people coming eventually over 20 years. And we got a Michelin star and everything. But we weren't, we weren't catering or cooking, nothing special. The, the caretaker, would, everyone would sit around the eat already and cook something up. You know, it was all, it was very a family feeling, right? Then came the big uh, redo of Chiori when we finally made it comfortable, which is put in proper toilet and bath and air conditioning and a nice kitchen and et cetera, and really raised it up to the level of, of a proper uh, inn, really, although it's not an inn, it's, it's a single house, but um, where we could start. And, and that's when we also did the other eight houses right around that time up in, uh, so we now have nine in here. Once you have more than one, then you have the infrastructure. It makes sense to hire several people. You can start to pay salaries. Uh, you can also, both Chiori and the other houses got officially registered with the government. We got the licenses that we need needed. All that happened in the early, uh, after 2012, which is when uh, Chiori got sort of ultimate restoration. And at that point, uh, we had uh, enough experience also because we had done this in Kyoto and in other places first before Ia. And so it, it, we, we kind of knew what to do. So I'm not sure that this is very helpful for someone that's just starting now uh, because uh, it, we just took our time on this. <laughs> um, one but thing overall, I'm, you've done over 40 projects around Japan. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. That's yeah, and each one was very, you know, they're all very different. And the local involvement is always very different and the issues are very different. Uh, one, one thing I would say is that uh, generally, it, it, sort of hiring people in general has become a national problem. And that the hospitality industry of Japan is, is suffering, including Kyoto. There are just not enough people to do the jobs. And so the, one of the biggest issues that's going to face anybody in any, even any hotel business, much less these old houses, is how to do it efficiently without a lot of labor cost. And we already do that. For example, when uh, we don't hand out keys to the house or something, it's all electronic. We can tell them on the internet, they can go to the house and get let themselves in, things like that. They don't check out, they just leave. Right. So all of the things like that save an incredible amount of time and labor. And of course, we're not uh, we've had Japanese guests say, why isn't there someone here to carry my bag? Well, you know, <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way. Well, let's dive into some of the examples from the book. Mm -hmm. I'd love to start in Tohoku um, mm -hmm. and your examples in Akita. Uh, yes. Oh, my goodness. It's such an interesting and unique uh buto talking about buto culture yeah. and the whole area of akita you've mentioned kyoto you've lived in rural kyoto for a long time um and you talk about akita being two and a half times bigger than yes than the yeah. oh yeah no it's huge and it took us hours you know to get from one town to another uh, and of course the expanses of rice paddies are on a scale that we never see in kansai you know, it's, it's, it's really a different world, and it's also a different cultural world. And so that was what, in, you know, you've got it marked, Kamaitachi Museum. And what this is all about is, of course, uh, I think most of our viewers would know what Buto is. Curiously, a lot of Japanese do not nowadays. So it's sort of more famous internationally, this. And it's, you know, it's that weird and wonderful sort of naked bodies all painted in white and doing grotesque things. and grimacing and acting like uh, they're about to die from some horrible disease or something. That's the look of Buto. Um, and it's fascinating. You can't take your eyes off it. And it's had a huge impact on dance all over the world, including within Japan, where they've kind of forgotten what the Buto was, but they're still doing what Buto taught them. So it has a, it's had a big impact even in this country. And the founder was a man by the name, was there are two founders, but one of them was called uh, Hijikata. And he was from this area. And he went up there with a famous uh, photographer. Uh, and the two of them produced these iconic, there he is, uh, 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 Hosoi Eiko. And they produced this iconic book, which is considered one of the most famous photo books ever produced within Japan. And maybe, uh, I'd say, 
among the top 10 in the world. It's up there with Anselm Adams kind of level of important photography. It, showing uh, Hijikata doing these weird things. Uh, that's one of the less weird ones. And there are others that are even more <laughs> weird in, in the village, in, in this very rural surrounding, but with this super hyper modern otherworldly, you know, Buto. And that became a kind of icon within the Buto world. So one of my friends, Michael Sakamoto, who's an, a, a Japanese American Buto performer and, and professor, and also a ph photography person said, Alex, you've really got to go here because it's got both sides. It's got the Buto and they set up a little museum about the making of that book and the photography involved in it and the, and what actually happened at that moment. So I went to this town called Tashiro. There's a village called Tashiro where it all happened. And it, it's it's a wonderful village with there's still old thatched houses. There, there's a lovely inn where we stayed. And you the rem those places where Hijikata did some of his weird and wonderful Buto poses, you can still find them. And sort of irresistible, you want to do it yourself. And Michael actually did. Um, and uh, I found myself at one, there's a scene where uh, <clears throat> Hijikata's kind of got his arms drooping and is looking down like that. And I tried it out. Um, but one of the, th there are a couple of thought provoking things here. Uh, one of which has to do, I think, with the Jomon era. And the thing about Jomon is we, everyone now, when we now think of Japan, it's Kyoto, Nara, tea ceremony, and all that sort of thing. And everything is so elegant and proper and refined and polished and whatnot. But Jomon, which was, you know, there, uh, which went for, you know, 50,000 years or something, can't remember the exact number, but tens of thousands of years, long before the modern Japan that we're now familiar with, is truly fascinatingly bizarre. V oh, you know, I've got another town there. Um, very uh, truly extreme objects with flanges coming off of them, and the the I images of gods ha are have you know they'll have breasts and beards. You know, it's all quite strange, but it it's Buto. It looks like Buto. You can see that the deep deep inspiration comes out of this. And Jomon, I think, is still with us, and especially in the north, because that's where it was centered. Another thing that is a little bit surprising, once I started thinking about it, I realized, you know, the, the real center of Japan in, the, in those prehistoric days was not down here in Kansai or Kyushu or anything like that. It was in the north, and the most important Jomon sites go from Nagano up to Hokkaido. Of course, we find them all over Japan. But the big centers were up there. I think maybe the temperature was different in those days. Uh, for some reason, that was where Japan's really ancient culture actually was based. And I think that Hijikata, who came from that town, felt that. He was receiving something from long underground, almost something Lovecraftian, you know, <laughs> boiling up from underneath that's ancient Jomon. And so that was part of what I was seeking there. I love I love that connection between Jomon and you also talk about the Ainu culture, the ancient cultures having that kind of outrageous, fun, uh, kind of scary elements, you know, like really yeah. different from what most people think of when they come to Japan and think of art or traditions. And everybody, so, everything ever so proper and people sitting with their hands clasped and smiling uh, and, and bowing and et cetera. And that is so not Jomon. Yeah. And of course, Hijikata was trying to blast through that. That was the idea of Buto. We're going to get away and we're going to get away from being pretty, right? And so, you know, the, the, if you look at books of the facial expressions of these Buto people, like, yeah. You know, it's just fabulous uh, because they were saying, look, you know, this is the modern age. There was the atom bomb. They had that in their minds, too. It's not it. There's suffering. There's horror. There's this stuff going on. And are we going to ignore it? And so that was another aspect. And I, I was watching a, a really great short video I made by the San Francisco Museum of Contemporary Art about Hosoi Eiko-san and mm -hmm. uh, him talking about how uh, the villagers would all be a bit scared 
of of him doing his performance yes. art. And sure. then they started laughing and playing along and that connection to village life and community as well. Yes. As he talked about uh, his roots in Tohoku and mm -hmm. the connection to the earth and mm -hmm. nature and the, the rice paddies and things. Mm -hmm. um, so those, those deep connections as well, really interesting. That was another huge thing for Hijikata who talked to, he never actually lost his Akita accent and he always talked about being close to the earth. And you feel it when you're in a place like Tashiro. And so that's, uh, I, for, I think Tashiro is really a kind of site of pilgrimage. And I think anyone interested in, in Buto, certainly, and in Japanese photography, and in the countryside, what the countryside really used to be, then you'd go to, a, you'd go to Tashiro. Interesting. Uh, Mendo had a, a big question here mm -hmm. about uh, funding regarding government grants. Any other mm -hmm. grants than the Akia Bank scheme? Well, the Akia Bank scheme doesn't amount to much from a grant point of view at all, really. It's just a system to help people, uh, somebody seeking an Akia find an Akia. Uh, there's not much money there, sadly. Uh, but there is money, all kinds of money in different agencies to, for example, restore uh, old uh, town uh, lands, uh, cityscapes, or to uh, help uh, uh, townships uh, uh, restore these old houses and use them as guest houses. And, and even for soft, uh, so-called softo, as they like to say in Japan, that is to say not a building thing, but a, but, a, but a program or an event or something like that. Uh, they're, they're, each different, all these different agencies have these menus. And that's actually part of what, what I do. That's part of what our consulting is, is we go to, because the villages and the towns often don't know what's available. And we'll say, look, if you do this, there is this funding over here that you can apply for, and you would be able to expand what you do, you know, and here's how to do it. And so, yes, that's that's crucial. There, there's, uh, unfortunately, so that's the good news that there there are these budgets, there are th these uh, grants. The bad news is almost all of it has got to be applied through the, your government, your local township. And if they're the kind of people that are forward looking and are interested, they'll help you do it and they'll get involved. And if they're not, then you'll just go nowhere. And it's very difficult for a private individual uh, to apply for these things. Yeah. Uh, just stepping back a little bit, you oh, yes. made a comment oh, about, oh, about Village Japan oh, and how that. you studied yeah. under John Hall. I did. And, yeah. And uh, in the prologue as well, uh, writing about how even your book, Lost Japan, uh, there's even more lost over time. But when you were talking about this book, Village Japan, that seemed like these villages would last forever, that they were very strong and stable. Uh, things have really changed since then, right? Well, that was something I, I wrote, which is, you know, in the days when, when I was uh, at Yale and studying under John Hall, and I actually wrote my senior thesis about Ia, right? Because I'd already found uh, Chiori by then. And of course, he was the great um, American expert on Japanese villages and had written this book, Village Japan. And at that point, of course, Ia was facing changes, but still th this ancient village life that had been there for thousands of years felt like it would go on with some changes more or less forever. And, and, it, and of course, in recent years, we're seeing a collapse and we're seeing it disappear before our eyes. And that will happen to Tashiro too, I fear although a little more slowly, she does do it in better shape, which is why it's touching, uh, because this is the village Japan that John Hall was writing about in Okayama, I believe is where he was, but it, it uh, up, up there in the north, it's still there. That's so and, good to hear. So it's a precious thing to see if you have the chance. And don't you feel like with every book that you write, Alex, you're documenting history as, as a way of, <laughs> this is Japan right now, you know, and then you talk about dogs and demons and th some things weren't true and some things are true. Hmm. Uh, it's, it's a really interesting landmark and a little point of history, isn't it? Well, we're, we're back to this thing about what's real. And in fact, one of the issues in writing this new book is the point of this book is let's rediscover these wonderful, somewhat hidden things that people don't really know about, but they're there and they're precious. But at the same time, 
it's not like I suddenly decided to forget about the fact that the rivers are destroyed and the mountains are concreted and so on. That's real too. And so dogs, dogs and demons must also exist in this book in order for it to be real. And so it's there. And I do talk about issues such as forestry. One of the things I'm very proud about, by the way, I'm going to personally uh, say that one thing that I'm proud about in this new book is I think I might be the first foreign writer who's ever looked at Japan's trees. People don't talk about trees. It's really ignored in the literature. And they go to the famous temple and they ignore the huge, fabulous ancient tree that's right next to it or whatever. They're looking at moss gardens. And especially people don't look at the mountainsides and the forests and what were the trees of Japan and what happened to those trees. That's talked about a lot in this book. And so one thing that's a kind of major sub story of the book is trees. And, and I'm very happy to, that I was able to do that. And in fact, in the new book that I've just done, uh, one of the places we go to is Aomori. And, and that's entirely what we do in Aomori is we go to, we find trees. And that was a, when you talked at the Satoichi 7 uh, summit, which I went to here in Hiroshima, you talked about uh, even city trees being cut down. Oh, well, city trees is a, is a truly tragic tale in modern Japan. And there's actually, this is something, again, that uh, people mostly haven't commented on, but uh, quietly, but very thoroughly, Japan has embarked in literally, and, just, and it's happened pretty fast in the last two or three years, um, or maybe five years, but I'd give it two or three is when it really sped up, on a massive tree exportation, extirpation <laughs> uh, campaign. And trees are disappearing, big, big trees and old trees are disappearing with incredible speed from city streets, from university campuses, from uh, uh, um, gardens and city parks. Uh, it's, it's astonishing because trees are dirty and dangerous. And that has become really a, a, an accepted dogma. And I see it everywhere. Um, and, and it's really tragic. And so this is something I, I talk about to get the word out there, because again, a lot of people literally don't see it. Partly because once the tree's gone, how do you see that it's gone, right? Uh, unless you knew there had been a tree there. I, I, it's one of my favorite things about traveling is seeing old growth trees. And especially if you see the twisted straw and the white paper on it, because then yeah. you know it, they, they realize and they're yeah. preserving it and it's special. Those it's exist not in but many in exist. Chicago, right? Those exist, but I can tell you uh, in public spaces, uh, any uh, any old or tall tree will be cut down. It's it's and it runs so against the trend of other advanced countries. I mean, New York has planted literally millions of trees. You look at a photo of Fifth Avenue, you'll be astonished. It's enormous, beautiful green trees the whole way, right? Um, uh, Singapore, oh my God, uh, the the freeway from the airport into town has actually appeared in world garden books as a garden, you know. So it doesn't have to happen, and it's not some kind of uh, sign of progress or something. Uh, anyway, here I'm getting into my dogs and demons mode. Yeah. But, but in any case, I do, uh, I do want to look at trees and talk about trees. Well, it's important, and especially in our urban areas where we have so much concrete, like Jingu Gayan in... Well, that's a case, right? A thousand, a hundred-year-old trees are going to be cut down in one swath. So, yeah. Uh, but it's not, only, it's not only these issues of city trees and trees getting cut down or not. It's what are we looking at? What are the trees? Let's think about it. What are the trees that really were part of this tradition and that were valued? And, and what did they stand for? And where are the great ones? That's something else I'm interested in. Well, I love that in the book, there's so many different examples of just going somewhere that's not famous, uh, appreciating the small details. You do that so well in your videos on your YouTube channel, in your books, uh, even talking about Basho and him uh, looking quietly at a, a mountain and yeah. writing poetry that he didn't write about famous places that everybody went to, right? Yeah. No, well, he, he did a few, but but even if he did, he had such a different take on it, right? 
uh, so for example, when he, as I mentioned in the book, when he went to uh, Nico, uh, he managed to write a poem about it without describing the shrine in any way. <laughs> you know? but, it but, about... captures, but it captures the essence brilliantly. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, the, the thing that you uh, have on the back of the book is a, a quote from Issey Miyake. Alex mm. Kerr is on a lifetime quest for beauty. And I love your example in the book about uh, Issey Miyake's dress and oh, yes. ironed it out and how the geography of Japan and how big it is. Mm. Can you give us yeah, that well, example? Yeah, the Japanese love to talk about how Nihon was semi, right? Japan is a small, narrow little country. And they think of Japan as small, partly because they've got America on the brain. They're looking at that. Uh, but, uh, but in fact, because Japan is so mountainous, and also the seaside is, is broken into thousands of little promontories and crevices and things, it, it, from a topographical point of view, if you were to flatten out all those mountains and hills, it would probably be as big as, as uh, Australia. And so you know, I really feel that. And that's one reason why Japan has so much variety, and you can travel to so many very different kind of places. Uh, be, because of that topography. And of course, the way Issei comes into it is that the, the uh, Issei um, pleats please, right? The, the pleated dresses, uh, you know, and I mentioned in the book that a friend of mine sent her to the cleaner and, and they didn't know what it was and they ironed it. <laughs> and so, you know, it doubled in size once they flattened it all out. And that, it, that would happen to Japan if you did the same thing. And you, you talk about uh, examples of that a few times, like the rice paddies, having uh, beautiful terraced rice paddies up on the hill, and the old ones have these tiny little lanes, mm -hmm. kind of like the, the rivets of the Issei Miyake dress. So yeah. it, it follows you through the book a little bit. I love those examples. Well, and also another thing about sort of no, one of the key things I think that I... I think I'm always trying to talk about, but especially in this book, is let's try to to know what we're looking at. So people look at rice patties, oh, lovely rice patties. But actually, there are two kinds of rice patties there. Thank you. You've just shown the oldest kind, which is uh, like a top topography map, right, where it just goes along with the uh, al altitude of the hill or the mountain. and And then this newer type, which is part of a big government national campaign to flatten them all out and to create these kind of uh, larger, uh, straighter rice paddies, which is where mostly it's going. And so it, those, those smallish ones that kind of curve along with the topography are rarer now. And they're both beautiful. And so uh, there, there's, I enjoy looking at both types, but it's interesting to just know what you're looking at. And so that's something that I also kind of talked about. Yeah, we, we noticed the rice planting, rice harvesting is is becoming uh, a, a time in connection with holidays to get your family to come and help you uh, because <laughs> yes. of the labor shortage. So yes. a lot of rice planting is now done at Golden Week, right? To get the family from the cities to come and help. Um, it shows that we're having a big decline in, in farmers. In oh, well, yes. And, and another issue which is really happening to Japan is, is the rewilding of Japan. Uh, if you travel anywhere in the countryside, you'll see a good percentage of the rice paddies are literally thrown away. They don't plant them anymore. There's just grasses growing there. And other fields were getting wild, uh, feral animals, wild boar and deer and all that kind of thing and 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 it's because the, there are just no more people and in a way of course i think that the probably the right way to think of it going forward of course the government's approach on all these things is we're going to protect we're going to save we're going to pour money into it and we're going to you know keep it the way it always was you can't so rewilding is going to happen like it or not and this is where Great Britain, uh, UK, is kind of in a, ahead of a lot of people. And they are actually big stretches of the countryside are now set aside for rewilding. Uh, and what they do, though, which is, I think, uh, very thought provoking, is they don't just walk away from it and let the weeds grow. They say, what were the plants that originally grew here? What were the animals that originally lived here? 
and they reintroduce beavers and that sort of thing. And they try to bring it back to the natural environment, the wild environment that had been there. So it's, uh, it's a controlled rewilding. In Japan, it's a chaotic rewilding that's just happening between the cracks because nobody's paying attention. Well, that, that reminds me of my talk with Alex K.T. Martin from Japan Times about uh, some people trying to bring back the wolf to Japan to have a natural apex predator. Mm -hmm. what's, what's your thoughts on that? Is it time to bring back the wolf? Uh, well, you know, these are wolves are difficult. Wolves and that kind of animal are really difficult. And I think in uh, Japan, I think that's not, probably not going to fly, sadly, because it, it, if you had more wide open spaces, uh, you might be able to do it. But um, I think where people are still fairly living in fairly dense villages, um, and especially now that everybody's older and they can't cope with it, I, I think that'll be difficult here. Yeah, we we've had in the news some bear attacks, and yeah. yeah, it's it's if you're living in a rural area and you're getting on in age, and yeah, another predator around is is not <laughs> really going to attract people, is it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but one of that that kind of connects to the Noto Peninsula, and there were so many great examples uh, from that area that you talk about. Mm -hmm. And the fact that uh, back in history, actually, it was a uh, middle route yes, of it was the, the, the famous trade route, the, ship, the famous trade ships, right? Yeah. Well, one of the things that was never taught when I was going to college, and I think most Japanese even are hardly aware of it, is that the shipping, that basically all the, the goods that went from Osaka to Edo and so on, they didn't go up the East Coast. And they didn't because it was stormy and there were not very good harbors. And also they didn't go along the old Tokaido road either. People went up the road, but not freight. So the way they did it was by water and it went all the way through the Inland Sea. And that's why we have Onomichi and towns like that, which were ancient shipping towns along the Inland Sea. And then they got to the Straits of Shimonoseki and they turned north and they went all the way up. And that's why you get Matsue and Kanazawa. You know, all these towns grew up because of this thing that they call the Kitamai Sen, right? And, and that was the name of the route. And it went all the way up to Aomori and then finally touched on Hokkaido. And along the way, they would stop at Kanazawa or Niigata or something. And at that point, the goods were loaded onto people's backs and it was carried to Edo. But it was much faster and easier and cheaper than trying to go up the Tokaido. And so in that process, which was the, a huge trade route, very wealthy and important towns grew up, such as Matsue. And, um, and in the center, right, literally the dead center of it all is Noto Peninsula, which they had to go around. And that's why the Great Lacquer Center is there. Because you now look at a map and you go, here's a whole building built of lacquer, stunning. And, and you wonder, well, why would the great lacquer center of Japan be in the middle of nowhere? Well, no, at that point, it was right in the center of the great trade route. And they could send their lacquer south to Osaka and north to Edo. It could go anywhere. And you were saying this is the, the highest quality lacquer you've seen in Japan coming from this area, right? Wajima? Wajima is, has always been considered, it traditionally was considered the best lacquer in Japan, and it still is. And there are other great lacquer centers, but Wajima has the crown, yeah. Yeah, but that's so interesting that now you think of Noto's Peninsula as so remote, so hard to get to, but actually in that Edo, and then Edo to Meiji really was the oh, yeah. time when it was the, the center of those trade routes. And in fact, its greatest thriving period was in the first few decades of Meiji. So the decline only really set in, I would say, after around 1920 or so, what with railroads and other things happening so that the freight could be uh, sent without loading it on ships. So the, the Ikita Maisen had an enormous impact and, and brought a lot of wealth to that area as well. Uh, and it's all. This has all been kind of in my travels of the last few years. This has been one of these things that I really learned about. I didn't, wouldn't, did, just didn't know. And uh, I love seeing the nearby Tohoku area, Fukushima, uh, the beautiful thatched villages. Uh, mm -hmm. There are some thatched villages you mentioned earlier, which are having overpopulate over tourism problems. 
um, but this is less and it's so beautiful. And you said uh, they are doing a different style of renovations on the Thash, but piecework, not entire. Oh, well, that, that's true of all of Tohoku. Is that right? Yeah, for example, and, and in fact, I first saw that in Tashiro, you know, in the, the Buto village, where they do a number of roofs every year, but they don't do the whole roof. They just patch up the part that's a little bit decayed and they add to it slowly. And and I've seen that e even in, um, uh, oh, oh gosh, the great pottery village north of Tokyo, uh, pottery town, oh, escaping me. Anyway, those houses too, the thatched houses, they do sort of bit by bit. Like they say, the human body, all the cells in our body change every seven years. Uh, something like that happens with thatch and tohoku. And of course, your first house, the Chiori house, had a beautiful thatch roof. Um, so you've you've changed it yourself. You've lived with thatch. Uh, oh, it's yeah. really appealing for international visitors and Japanese, I would say. Yes, the, uh, people in Japan tend to think of thatch as some kind of terrible burden and it's expensive and it'll all rot away and you'll have to do it again and all that. But from a tourism point of view, it has huge appeal. Plus, it's the ultimate echo material. And another thing that has happened that people are not aware of in this country is there's been a huge resurgence in Europe. Uh, people are building incredible uh, museums, uh, um, public uh, uh, buildings such as town halls, apartment houses, private homes with new thatch. Not that they haven't restored something old and they're doing incredibly adventurous contemporary ideas. And now there's some thatchers in Japan that have caught on to it. And so it's starting to get into this country, the idea that thatch is a contemporary material as well. Well, she's really exciting. I remember you saying one of the big issues for areas that want to redo thatch houses is they first have to grow the right pampas grass or right kind of straw. Well, uh, growing it sounds like it's planted and grown. They just need to let the mountains where it was growing be. <laughs> so right. the hard part is not the growing so much as the cutting because you really can't cut the thatch until it gets rather cold and wintry uh, because it, you need this long, uh, stable um, uh, stem of the thatch, which, and, and so, you know, people going up into those mountainsides and cutting thatch in December or January, it's, it's harder and harder to find people that will do it. And you've told me if you take care of it, you keep it dry, it can last over a hundred years. Uh, well, a very, uh, you'd have to do some work on it in the meantime, but it can certainly last 40 to 50 years. And that's longer than a tin roof will last you. It's beautiful too. Yeah. It just has so much appeal. Yeah. Oh, I can't believe we've only got eight minutes left, Alex. <laughs> We're having such a great conversation. We barely dived Somebody in. Is, I noticed someone in the, uh, Melanie in the comments has said Mashko. Yes, in Mashko, uh, there's one, one of the great potters there has an enormous, beautiful thatched house and they do it in that piecemeal way. And that's one of the first places I saw that happening. Now, uh, let's talk about Totori, because you just got back from a trip in Totori. Uh, yeah, yesterday. And Totori is in your book, a really interesting areas. Totori gets the least visitors, uh, even less than Tohoku area, I've heard. Yes, uh, yes. And you talk about Chizu. Chizu and, and Yazu. Yazu. And yesterday I was in Yazu, uh, but the book uh, which, has, which has this unique temple with a Shinto shrine inside the temple, which I have truly not, never seen anywhere else. Plus in Chizu, this astonishing, if you could go back to that, uh, the Ishitani house. Yes. <clears throat> I mean, I think this is the Todaiji of Japanese houses. I've never seen a grander one ever. And it was a very wealthy lumber king. And so they built this house out of timbers that you will just never see anywhere. Vast, astonishing. And that exists in this distant sort of place that people don't go to. Um, Yazu, where I, where I was yesterday, is is rather promising because the town is starting to pay attention to landscaping in a way that mostly is, hasn't happened so much in Japan. For example, getting them to paint signs in brown or, or more faded looking colors rather than the bright red and bright green and everything that you see. Uh, painting guardrails along the uh, highway instead of being shiny white painting them brown and giving some funds to local groups that are doing it. So I was quite impressed by that. 
That's great to hear. I, I sometimes hear about uh, people getting funding to redo the walkways, uh, the hiking paths as well, to yeah. make them safer. And that's that's wonderful. Unfortunately, um, what usually excited. happens with, I was going to say, you know, this took me right into, usually, sadly, when they're doing those hiking paths, it means putting in a lot of signage and bright red arrows go this way and watch your head and don't take photos and don't smoke and be careful of mountain fires and da da da, da. And so it becomes littered with unsightly signage, uh, sadly, is the default, you know. Now, here's a lovely case where they removed it. Yeah. Isn't so, that so. great to see? So you do yeah. have some positive examples uh, oh, yeah. that these signs are not impossible to remove. Maybe you can remove them. They and can. I noticed and now all they your beautiful pictures, too. Alex. All the <laughs> the lines are buried. In, I don't see lines in many of these. No. They've they've invested in burying the they electrical have. wires. Yes, and so it does happen, and um, and there is beginning to be a bit more consciousness. The town of Hockey, by the way, has strict color controls on signage for the whole town. Uh, so it, it it there are these sort of very promising signs too. Oh, that's good to hear. And I love these clay walls in Hagi. Yeah. By the way, I noticed one of our questions. Okay. It says, while driving through the countryside, I noticed a number of old Comingos that had their thatched roof covered in metal. Was that popular? Was it cheaper for a time? Whatever. Well, of course, it's the it's an easy way because you don't have to keep rethatching and it's cheaper. And so most of the thatched roofs of Japan, have, not just some, I'd say 95% of all the thatched roofs in Japan are now covered in metal. And that has a very beneficial impact because they didn't destroy them. And what they do, they don't remove the thatch. They just The thatch is where it always was, and they just put the tin on top, mostly. And so if you're inside looking up, you can see the thatch. And it's actually preserved and protected many tens of thousands of thatched roofs that exist all over the country. And you don't see it when you travel. Because if you're looking for that, you won't see thatch. But the, the giveaway, by the way, anyone that's looking for these things, if it's a very high-pitched roof, and if it looks a little fat on the underside, you're looking at a thatched roof that's been tinned. And in fact, that is something I talked about in, in uh, Hidden Japan, uh, up in Fukushima and so on, where, where we could we were finding these, that there was actually a rich culture of old thatched roofs. It's just you didn't see it because of the tin. Well, Chris has just written uh, that he harvested thatch. Oh, wonderful. Oh, good. Suzu. Oh, congratulations. I wish I could have been there. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, Carolina says she's reading another Kyoto right now. She loves the book, and she'll definitely read another work of Mr. Kerr. Well, wonderful. Happy to hear it. And Ellen said that she thought it looked like Hagi. Um, it's wonderful that everyone's joining today and you've been to so many of these wonderful places that Alex talks about in the books. It's really exciting. You think, do you have the feeling, Alex, that more and more visitors are, are willing to go out in the lesser known, uh, less famous areas? I feel like there is a trend that way. Oh, I do. I agree with you completely. I, I, f I see it everywhere. And uh, you go to these places where nobody ever used to go, and then you see them. And uh, and I think it's it's partly a more mature tourist industry. Remember, this is the way it's always been in Europe. Everybody, it isn't that just everybody went to Florence and that was it. No, they were always going to these little Tuscan towns and so on. That's been there for a hundred years. In Japan, until pretty recently, it was just big bus tourism and you packed them in and they went from Tokyo to Kyoto and to Osaka, you know, and back again. That's matured. And you have a lot of repeaters and you have people that travel on their own and, and Japanese too, it's not just foreigners who are willing now to experiment and go to these pretty unusual places. So yes, I think it's definitely changing. And people taking more time, not rushing around and just taking pictures with the sites. Of course, we have uh, big places for mass tourism. We have to have all the Instagram meccas. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's so nice to see enthusiasm uh, yes. through your book. Thankfully, you're giving us so many great insights as well. But there do, it does seem a perfect time to come out with this book. I hope everybody reads it and gets inspired. Well, I do too. And thanks for asking about it. 
Yeah, wonderful. Is there anything we didn't talk about? We've got another minute, Alex. Any final words before we sign off? Uh, uh, well, I guess the one thing that the, the very last, it's not really a true chapter. It's just a little kind of epilogue at the end where I talked about tourism and the issues of over-tourism and the issues of, uh, of what we should think about going forward in, in, in tourism. And this partly applies to people such as me as writers. Because there is a question of how much I should write about these places if I don't want them to be destroyed. And in fact, in the new book, there are going to be, in this book, there's one spot where I never tell people its name or where it is in hidden Japan. And in the new book, there will be several. But one of the things that's been on my mind is there. there's the issue, when you're talking about tourism management, what do you do? if you're a temple or a town or and you're you're on the the, the receiving side right there and there are many different policies and systems and i call it technologies of management to reduce the the downside of tourism right that's as a receiver but let but what people haven't thought so much about is what do you do as you the traveler because one of the things i read somewhere someone said tourism is other people traveling <laughs> because <clears throat> we don't think of ourselves as tourists, but of course we're also con contributing to some of those issues every time we go anywhere. And so you have to then start asking yourself this question. Would, if, for example, I'm not probably going to go to the Galapagos because I will only add to its difficulties. So I'm not going to bring good to the Galapagos necessarily by going there as a tourist. And so I probably won't. And so that's a kind of question you've got to ask yourself. And another one, which is, where can, where do they really need me? So if you go to the Scramble Crossing in Tokyo, no one will ever know the difference, and they don't need you, and in fact, you're in the way. Go to Ia or Tashiro or some of these other places I mentioned where they're desperate and they need help and they can really benefit from the travel. You can add something. And so that's a question to ask yourself as, as a traveler. That's a fantastic way to leave it. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Wonderful talk. Go out and buy the book, Hit It, Japan. <laughs> it's a wonderful Christmas present. Uh, if you're looking for things to read in winter, uh, it inspires you about a better way to travel. And also, uh, one other point at the end, you're talking about tourism, mm. is how we think about uh, promoting certain places. Definitely, we want to promote places where we're going to support community, uh, we're going to encourage people to stay longer, have more meaningful travel, which is better for the visitor, but also better for locals, better for the environment as well. Thanks so much, Alex. Thanks, JJ. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Have a great night. Take care. See you next time.